So hello and you're very welcome to this menopause awareness webinar entitled Journey to Menopause, How Can Diet Help? My name is Deirdre Dunn, I work in health and wellbeing and I'm delighted to welcome our presenter today, Ashlyn Murphy. Ashlyn is a KORU registered senior dietitian who has been working in health and wellbeing in the Southeast, in Southeast community healthcare for many years. So she's hugely experienced and uh, Ashton is very passionate about helping people to live healthier lives through food. So I'm delighted to welcome Ashton and Ashton, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks a million. Thank you so much, Deirdre. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Jill and the Menopause Awareness Working Group in the Southeast. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so thrilled that you can join in as well. And we have the guts of an hour, more or less. So what will we be covering? I guess diet is one of those things that's a bit of a loaded term and everybody has an opinion on diet, which can make it even more confusing. So what we will be covering by the end of the hour is how eating for our gut health may help balance our hormones. So we'll be diving in a little bit there. You may have heard of a term called phytoestrogens. What are they and can they help us as we journey through menopause? And we'll also be just simply looking at what's on our plate and what foods on our plate can help support not just our bones as we journey through menopause, but also our joints and our brain. So thank you for joining. Sit back, relax, grab yourself a cup of water, tea, and, um, and settle yourself in. So menopause as a word, when we think of the M in menopause, it has been quite misunderstood and misrepresented for a long time. What you see on screen is a scene from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And on this scene, you'll see that Mrs. Bennet, who's one of the main characters, is actually in the throes of late perimenopause, about to enter menopause. And her famous line right throughout Pride and Prejudice is, please have compassion for my nerves. Now, she herself probably didn't know the hormonal highs and lows that were happening through perimenopause. And certainly it could be kind of guessed that her husband didn't know either because his remarks to Mrs. Bennett were often very sarcastic and snide. And if we could sit Mrs. Bennett down today, and if we could reassure her and say, you know what? Over 50% of women living in Ireland actually experience this feeling of anxiety as they go through the perimenopause years. And why is that? Well, when we enter perimenopausal period of our life, it's a bit of a hormonal roller coaster. As you can see on screen, the female hormones, estrogen, that are keeping our cycles going, are kind of getting highs and lows at the beginning. So the periods can get quite irregular, uh, confusing because the frequency can go out of balance. And with high levels of estrogen, the blood flow can be quite heavy as well and possible risk of fibroids. But more importantly, when we're talking to Mrs. Bennett, we would say, you know, you're just about to cusp over to menopause. So you can see that your estrogen levels are starting to dive a little bit. And estrogen and progesterone, they actually help keep our storage hormones in check. So cortisol should be just released to wake us up in the morning, to kind of run when we see the tiger on the street. But when our estrogen and progesterone is dipping, it actually means that this stress hormone, this cortisol, is leaking out a little bit more than it should over small matters. And that's a normal response to the change in our hormones. And to reassure Mrs. Bennett, it would be, you know what, this perimenopause pause period, it is a finite period in time, it will pass and things will settle down. So if Mrs. Bennett could settle into that and understand, okay, I'm not alone, she might breathe oh, and go, that's a relief. 
And then she might feel a bit empowered to maybe write a letter to her husband, Mr. Bennett. And if she was to sit down and think about what would she say, it might sound something like this. Dear Mr. Bennett, I'm on a bit of a hormonal roller coaster. You may find that some days I'm losing keys and different things, and then I'll find them again. You may also find that some days, you know, little things really annoy me. And also you might find that, you know, I want a bit more time to myself and a bit more space to myself. But because you're my husband, Mr. Bennett, you're on this journey with me. So you gotta buckle up and understand that. So please have compassion for my nerves. And P.S. Mr. Bennett, can I just say, if there was such a thing as male menopause, I would be so there for you. So it is just a reminder that no woman is an island. We are in communities with our colleagues, with our managers, with our friends, with our families. And the more that people can understand what we're going through, the more compassion people will have for us. But more importantly, the more compassion we can have for ourselves. Because in the perimenopausal period, this is often when the seed of disapproval is set within them people. And it's often said that women would feel a loss of confidence, they've lost their spark, and they often need a lot of reassurance in this period that this will too pass. So when we're looking at this very common feeling of anxiety, in the perimenopausal period, and perimenopause can happen anything up to 10 years before menopause. And menopause is that point in time, which is 12 months after the last period. So if we're looking at how anxiety affects our diet, well, certainly when we're in this survival mode, a lot of the time, you know, we intellectually know what to eat, but when we're in this fight or flight response, we often crave sugary foods. So all good intentions can actually go out the window. But also what I would definitely see in working with people is the fast thinking of anxiety can lead to fast eating. And fast eating means that foods can flow quite quickly down our food pipe. And our stomach is a, like a bag of muscles, really, and it needs to be warmed up. So by chewing our food very slowly, we're helping prepare our stomach to receive food. So this is really, really important. So it's learning to slow down our pace of eating. Because if we eat a lot, if you can imagine, our stomach is like a washing machine. And if you overstuff a washing machine, the stuff that comes out is a bit icky. And by eating very, very fast, it can cause bloating in our upper uh, belly region and cause really distressing symptoms as well. So my first tip here would be, what's the energy that you're bringing to the plate before we look at what's on the plate? Are we coming to the plate nice and relaxed? Or do we have quite a, a flustered energy? But the good news is we can regulate our nervous system and we can get it to go into that rest and digest mode of being. And how do we do that? Really simple again. If we want to slow down our thoughts, we just simply learn to slow down our breath. So just let's try that for a moment. So wherever you're sitting, just get yourself comfortable in your chair and ground yourself. So that's two feet flat on the floor. And as you do that, you're stabilizing your core and you might find yourself sitting up a bit straighter. And as you sit up straighter, you might feel a nudge to maybe, you know, there might be a bit of tension somewhere in your body. Just look to maybe release that, this, any tension. And maybe just get a little bit curious and see where are you breathing from? 
If you're breathing from your chest area, then you bring that breath deeper and lower into your belly area. Yeah. So if we, as we do that, and as we breathe deeper, what's happening is our system is going into rest and digest. When we are in this rest and digest way of being, we are more able to chew our food slowly. The recommendation is around 50, 15, I should say, 15 to 25 times per bite. So maybe there's a clue in the word menopause. Pause to help rest and digest as our digestive system changes throughout these years. And as we pause and as we de deeply breathe from our belly region, you're also reconnecting with your gut. So your gut is your point from what you eat to what you excrete. But in connecting to our lower belly region, you're reconnecting with a thing you might have heard of. It is called the gut microbiome. So you might have heard of that. So what it very simply is, it's over 100 trillion microbes that live within our system. And they're, they work so well in harmony. So we're talking about bacteria, viruses, fungi, they all work in great harmony together to help us digest our food and to help regulate our immunity. So we're not overreacting to things and we're not underreacting. Our immunity is at that Goldilocks point of just right. So people may have heard of this gut microbiome and what may not be so well talked about is a little factory within this gut microbiome and this factory is called our estrobolome so in this little factory are lots of workers working very well together to help regulate the amount of estrogen in our body so remember we don't want the high peaks we don't want the the real lows we want Goldilocks just right. And this little factory of workers within our gut microbiome can really help regulate the highs and lows experienced of hormones in the perimenopausal period. Again, that can be anything up to 10 years before menopause starts. So how can we make this gut microbiome happy? The first thing is to relax, manage your stress responses. Remember Mrs. Bennett? Breathe deep, learn to regulate the nervous system so it gets into rest and digest. And yoga, meditation in the perimenopausal, menopausal years is such a great ally, ally to have. It really helps regulate the nervous system and when the wheels are turning really nice on the gut microbiome it helps the wheels turn and the little factory which makes estrogen and helps regulate estrogen within our body so learning to manage our stress responses is really important to make this gut microbiome happy but also in terms of what's on our plate, what can we do to make this gut microbiome happy? Well, if it had a voice, it would say to you, you know what? My needs are really simple, so don't stress out. What I really love is lots of fruits and vegetables. So when you come to sit at breakfast, lunch and dinner, are you, is half of your plate filled with fruits and vegetables? The vegetables I really, really love for building up lots of good bacteria in my microbiome 
is I love leeks, onions, garlic, asparagus, artichokes. These are rocket fuel for me. So the more you can incorporate these into your dinners, I'll be just so happy. The fruits I love, bananas. Can you snack on bananas? Because I will just be singing with delight if you can eat bananas. I also love grapes, berries, kiwis, apples, pears. If you are on occasion having a nice glass of red wine, I won't say no to that. It has what we call polyphenols. Also look at one quarter of your plate, it would say to you. And if your gut microbiome could speak to you, it would say, you know what? I really love when potatoes and pasta is reheated because that gives me what's called a thing resistant starch. So all these beneficial bacteria will really munch that up and it will help feed them to work in your favor. If you're buying sourdough bread, do just remember that the microbes made in the sourdough cooking process often do get destroyed by heat unless they're heat resistant. So think about yesterday's dinner. If you reheat that pasta or reheat your potatoes, I'll be really happy as your gut microbiome. Another thing just to say I love is beans, but do try and get the variety in. So it's not just chickpeas, it's your black beans, your soybeans, lentils. Again, if you're making up a casserole, a curry, you know, bulk up your curries and stews with these great pulses. You may know that when you eat these, it produces a little bit of gas, and that's just a signal that the microbes in my gut are munching on them and enjoying them and helping to make you happy. Just to say the beans are also found in cocoa beans and coffee beans. So a lovely piece of dark chocolate I enjoy, that's polyphenols, along with a really nice cup of coffee. It would also say to you, you've probably heard of probiotics. And where we get that is we get it in our fermented dairy. So we're just talking about your regular natural yogurts. Do look at the label at the back and you'll see that there's live cultures. That's what I like as your gut microbiome. It will always also say your cheese. So even your regular standard cheese has a few microbes in it that will really benefit the gut microbiome. And if you do want to spend a few extra pennies, you know, the kefir that you can now get in most supermarkets would have quite a bit more microbes than your regular natural yogurt. So if you want to mix that up with your yogurt, that will really help me as your gut microbiome. So when we're looking at what builds up this gut microbiome, the good news to say is that our gut is very plastic. And if you start to make small changes within four to six weeks, you will see a benefit. And how can I start? Well, the trick is really small, not doing, not being over enthusiastic because all the foods that you're seeing in, on screen are quite high in fiber. So we want to increase each portion of fruit or veg by maybe one over a three day period and then keep increasing until you get to maybe five to seven portions of fruit and vegetables a day but do it really really slowly because your gut has to adapt because remember when you're introducing a new food new microbes are being brought on the scene to help digest that so do it very slowly okay and then it's also a reminder to, to be drinking enough when we start increasing our fiber intake. And when we are looking at what is a portion of vegetables, well, if you look at my two outstretched hands, that would represent the amount of leaves on your plate, like spinach leaves or your salad leaves. Uh, palm would represent the amount of fruit as a portion, a piece of whole fruit or dried fruit. 
and the fist would represent a portion of vegetables on the plate. So build it up slowly, start increasing the fluid and also introduce exercise to help move the muscles in your intestine and really help food move through the system as well. So start small and do build it up. And when we look at these foods on the plate, it has the phytoestrogens that we're going to talk about. And one of those phytoestrogens is thing called flavonoids that we get, remember, in the onions, the garlic, which your gut microbes love. They also love the grapes in that, the polyphenols. They also love the flax seeds as well. So for a moment, just take a pause and see, is there anything, so if we start small, so is there anything within the next three days that I can increase and build on and increase after that? Remember, strength is built in increments. There is no such thing as an overnight success when it comes to building our healthy eating habits. It's small and steady builds the race. So just take a moment to, Ah, breathe in and, and look and maybe jot down something that you can do. So with the phytoestrogens, a lot of them are already really healthy foods that we get to build up our gut health. And the big question is, what exactly are they? Well, phyto means plant. And phytoestrogen basically means estrogen-like compounds that are found within the plants. So that's basically what it's meaning, okay? So it's found in a lot of what we call prebiotics, just what we discussed about the fruit and veg part of the plate, which feeds the beneficial bacteria in our gut microbiome. But it's also found in, um, which is a bit more studied, it's found in soya products. So the next question is, if I'm experiencing hot flushes, and again, that's very, very common, as we, at the late stage of perimenopause and when we go into menopause, and people are wondering, will the phytoestrogens help me? Well, the only answer to, to that is everyone is highly individual because everybody's gut microbiome is just like everyone's fingerprint. It is so unique. So foods, my gut microbes will digest, you may not digest. And the same principle occurs when it comes to the soya-based products. In Korea, China, Japan, South Asian countries, they've always taken a lot of soya products. So in these parts of the world, their guts, their gut microbes have actually very well adjusted to digesting soya products. But when it comes to the Northern hemisphere, our guts have very well adjusted to digesting our dairy. And if we start introducing soya-based products, some of us may digest it well, others may not. And the only way to find that out if you digest it well or not is to simply test and see. So if I am going to test and see, do soya products have any benefit on reducing the number and intensity of hot flushes? Well, my advice would be, again, start very, very small and build up. So we're talking about very, very small portions of soya beans, tofu or soy milk, just a couple of times a day. Don't sit down to one great big curry that's filled with tofu. Just start really small to let those gut microbes start seeing if they like them, if they adjust them and then increase. And for a benefit, we really are talking about giving two to three months to see if our system adjusts and is there an effect on reducing the number and intensity of hot flushes. So it's definitely a case of test and see. 
everybody is so unique. And that's why in nutrition, there is no one size fits all. We will always recommend that you consult with a KORU registered dietitian where really no stone goes unturned and you get fully assessed and advised accordingly. So when, period, when people are experiencing this period of going through hot flushes, there's also you know, heaty, a heaty nature in alcohol. So women may instinctively, you know, really, really cut back on alcohol. And that's because alcohol has a heaty nature. Also coffee and caffeine. So caffeine in our chocolate and even the small bits of caffeine in our tea. The caffeine and particularly coffee, which is the highest amount of caffeine. Coffee is actually very heating. So it's a very heating drink and that can really aggravate hot flushes. And again, everyone's sensitivity to coffee is so, so, so different. And it's a case of test and see how is your body reacting. And as we reconnected with our gut microbiome, and if you remembered, we, we were breathing very deep into like our belly region. And by reconnecting with our gut microbiome, remember that there is such a thing as 100 million neurons in this area. So it's like our intuition, it's our instinct. So, you know, we, our body sometimes even leans into food or leans out, and that can be our intuitive response to food. But very often our mind, when we work from the neck up, will rationalize these intuitive nudges as well. So always kind of, you know, the more we slow down our breathing and slow down our thinking, we naturally become more intuitive, not just with food, but in life in general. So that's just, when it comes to do phytoestrogens work, no harm in trying, but do monitor and see if it is of benefit. So we just talked about how the gut is, has almost like cells, brain cells within it. It's like a second brain, you know, where our intuition, our instinct lies. You're leaning in or leaning out to things the whole time, but our mind can over-rationalize that away. Or, or even when we talk about healthy eating, it's actually really, really simple. And deep, deep, deep down, you know it all, but the mind will always want to air, add layers of complexity to simple things. And we can get very confused and get swayed by all the influencers on YouTube. So it is very simple, but simple is not always easy when it comes to eating whole foods and having our plate where half our plate is filled with fruits and vegetables, a quarter with whole grain carbohydrates and a quarter with protein. So it was a great uh, research done in, uh, not too long ago by the Department of Health. So just as they found out that it's very common for women to experience anxiety in the perimenopausal period, it's extremely common for women to experience bits of memory lapses. And um, this can actually be very distressing for women as they go through on the journey to menopause. And they can start losing confidence in themselves. And maybe when work projects are thrown their way, they can, oh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, because it's that feeling of losing confidence, um, which is a natural response to when there is small memory lapses occurring. And the reason why that might happen. So if we look at the later stages of perimenopause, our brain is still working hard to stimulate estrogen or ovaries to stimulate estrogen for menstruation to continue right until me uh, menopause occurs. And when that's happening, it means that, you know, estrogen can transport glucose to the brain. There may be less glucose going to the brain. So, you know, we might walk into a room and then God, what did I walk in for? Forget about that, that's normal. We might misplace keys, forget names. 
find a bit hard to join the dots together when we hear something new. Again, these are natural fluctuations to the highs and lows of hormones. Perimenopause is a finite period of time and it will pass. And I do think the, the time of perimenopause, people don't get wor warning of what's ahead. And really what when we are forewarned, we are for, forearmed, so to speak. So what can we do to help our brain? My first tip would be hydrate. Have you got a glass of water beside you? Are you drinking enough? By drinking enough is the easiest way to feel better and improve our concentration. When we're thirsty, we're starting to lapse in our concentration. And when we sleep overnight, we lose around a pint of water. So a really good tip is when you wake up in the morning, can you have a pint of water, a pint of warm water before you put the kettle on and have your nice cup of tea and coffee? I'd also be saying if you can, between meals, try it and get in, sip on a pint of water because when we come to the table, we want that little glass of water to be quite little when we come to the table. So just to be taking sips of water while we eat, because if we take great big gulps of water while we eat, that can dilute the digestive enzymes. Remember so much digestion occurs when we chew food, really important that we chew food really, really well. So that's almost liquid when it tran transports itself through the food pipe to the stomach. Again, remember, it's a bit like a washing machine. It doesn't want to be overloaded. So have a think about, am I drinking enough? Maybe we just pause into that. How can I remind myself to drink more? really handy. This is in the kitchen where I'm working. These nice pint sized glasses. Can we drink more of that between meals? And then when we look at what's on the actual plate, you may have heard that our brain is a big blob of fat. And you're totally right. It is. And two thirds of the fat in our brain, would you believe it, is made up of what we call omega-3. And you may have heard that we can get this omega-3 from oily fish, and you're absolutely spot on, we do. We should be aiming to have oily fish once to twice a week. So how can we do that? Well, you know, just even very inexpensive choices, like tinned sardines, tinned salmon, tinned mackerel, or you could go for the smoked version of mackerel. You get a few smoked mackerel for a couple of euro. So try to ritualize putting that in your shopping trolley every week. They can be easily flaked over so many foods, sandwiches, salads, you name it. The limits is just your imagination. If you don't really like the oily fish, you can get it from flax seeds, you can get it from chia seeds, or even try to take a couple of walnuts a day, two walnuts a day. And if you even look at the walnut on screen, it kind of does look like our brain, doesn't it? So the more we can incorporate these really good fats into our diet, most days, we're kind of restructuring the content of our brain. And remember, just as our gut is plastic, our brain is plastic. So it is possible to eat ourselves into a better brain as we get older. I would say that the oily fish is much better absorbed in terms of the anti-inflammatory effects of omega-3 than the flax seeds or the chia seeds. But, you know, whatever works for you, you know, and again, start small and, and build up on whatever works for you. But people know that, you know, this omega-3 is good for the brain, but they might forget because 
carbohydrates is one of those loaded words as well. It's been demonized. And the reason the word carbohydrates has been demonized because it's been lobbed in to all the refined carbohydrates that we get from our biscuits and, and sugary snacks. And that's why people are a little bit phobic when it comes to the word carbohydrates. But it's really important to remember at breakfast, lunch and dinner to have one quarter of our plate filled with whole grain carbohydrates, because if your brain could speak to you, it would say this is the fuel I like the best. I don't like making glucose from anything else but these whole grain carbohydrates. So just think about breakfast, lunch, dinner is a quarter of your plate filled with whole grain carbohydrates. Again, really nice snacks in between meals are fruit. So again, a portion of fruit, size of the palm of your hand, if that's pieces of dried fruit, berries, or a piece of whole fruit. And a piece of fruit, again, is a nice bit of um, burst of glucose that your brain likes to use as well. So is there carbohydrates on my plate? Remember, it's all about balance. It's all about balance on the plate. So that's the brains. And then you can see there that um, as we move through perimenopause and menopause, you can see that estrogen goes down, the estrogen levels go down. So you can see that on screen. And estrogen has an anti inflammatory effect. So, you know, again, the Department of Health found that, you know, quite a high proportion of women are experiencing joint pain, you know, as they progress further. So can we look to our diet to, to help our, um, promote anti-inflammatory responses within our, within our diet? So um, one moment as I get this. Pardon me. I just got a sign there to charge in. So excuse me, uh, my charge in the, the laptop, I'm back in, I'm charged up. And let's uh, so apologies for that, uh, listening in. Uh, so I did uh, just to get back to what I was saying, can we look at diet to help our joint health? So yes, we can is the good news. And uh, what I have here, remember we were saying the walnut looked like a brain. What I have here, I don't know if you can see on screen, it's a piece of fresh ginger. We can get this in any supermarket, which is brilliant. And um, ginger con contains a thing called gingerol. And that is really good at providing an anti-inflammatory response within our body. So ginger is really, really good. I have to say, I, I use this every time I eat and drink because I, even when I'm making black tea, I'm grating ginger into my tea. So I just love ginger. Um, again, garlic is really, really good. The more garlic we can take, the better for our system as well. I'll give you a trick here. When you cut your garlic and when it's chopped, if you can leave it sitting for 10 minutes because it will activate a compound called allicin within the garlic. And this is really, really, really a, a compound that provides such wide ranging health promoting benefits for our body. So that's a little tip if you're using garlic. Again, turmeric in cooking along with black pepper. And we hear a lot about the Mediterranean diet. And yes, it is fabulous. But I have to wave the flag for the Indian diet because they use spices with everything. And um, it really helps the digestion of our food because digestion does change a bit as we go through the journey through menopause. So the more times we can um, get inspired by Indian cooking, the better. It really, really is. So are you including cinnamon? Are you including coriander? Are you including caraway seeds, mustard seeds? Lots of different spices to explore. 
and it would be considered as plants that feed our gut microbiome as well. So just have a, a bit of a pause into that, you know, uh, am I really, uh, you know, can I start maybe having a spice box at home? Or uh, I remember when I was growing up, we had one of those shelves that hold spices, but my mother only, you, I think it was the clove she just used for making apple tart, she didn't use anything else. So it's trying to get a bit more adventurous with our eating and um, to spice up our plate. It's really, really good and helps our joints. And of course, we talked about the fish, you know, as a structural part of our brain. It works, the omega-3 works to reduce inflammation. It's anti-inflammatory. So again, can we create a culture when we're shopping to remember to put in oily fish, you know, so we can take it once to twice a week. And, you know, enjoying the fats from whole food sources. Again, fat has got very demonized. We need we need fat to help with the fluidity of our cells, so our hormones can can come in and out really really well. So try and take a tablespoon of nuts and seeds a day if that's possible. Our bone health, you all know, you're all from being raised at home. The glass of milk, and um, yes, it's really really good. But also we can forget, remember breakfast, lunch and dinner, half our plate, vegetables, a quarter plate, whole grain, but have a brain tattoo. Uh, is there protein on that plate? Because not only does it help build and repair our muscles, it also helps build and repair our bones. So that's important. Cow's milk is one of the cheapest sources of high quality protein. Um, and again, so we should be aiming for three portions of dairy a day. You can have that through yogurts, cheese, really good for your gut microbes, um, or a glass of cow's milk to make up a cappuccino. Uh, uh, over the age of 65, we should be increasing that to four portions of dairy a day. For those who are looking to try a little bit of soya milk, you can see on screen the soya milk is pretty similar in content to the protein content of your cow's milk. But when you go to the other milk alternatives that are out there in the supermarket, so that's almond, rice, coconut, uh, potato milks, actually you can see Have we lost Ashlyn? Can anybody else hear? I'm here, Deirdre. Yeah. Have we lost session? I'll, I'll just run down and just see what's. Um... Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that, everybody. Carry on, Ashton. Thank you, Deirdre. Apologies for that. Um, there seems to be a few gremlins where I am, so uh, bear with me. Just to pick up the point there on the protein within our cow's milk is much higher than the proteins in our plant-based milk alternatives. So do bear that in mind. So um, also too, do bear in mind, am I having enough protein at breakfast? If I'm making porridge, can I put some milk in that porridge? Can I put a slice of cheese on my toast? Can I add some protein to my bread if I'm just having a soup and sandwich? And that will help regulate the amount of protein that we're having at dinner time, which is so important that we have regular amounts of protein throughout the day. Because if we have a great big dinner at night time, it can disrupt our digestion um, as we sleep at night time. So just to bear that in mind as well. And not, uh, well, it is surprising when I saw that, you know, up to 70% of women going through menopause are experiencing issues with their sleep. And that can result in poor food choices the next day as a response of disruptions in their hormones connected with hunger and appetite. But also too, good sleep is so, so important to help clear 
the um, debris of our gut microbiome. And when we are overthinking from anxiety during the day, good quality sleep helps clean out any debris in our brain as well. So do have a think about your own bedtime routine. My tip would be to you, have your last meal three hours before you go to bed, because digestion is one of the most energy consuming processes in the body. In fact, the Spanish have an institution for this, it's called siesta. So you wanna make sure by the time you go to sleep that your body is almost finished digesting a lot of what you've eaten so your body can concentrate on getting the laundry guys out to clear up the, your insides and help regenerate your body for the next day. Again, the blue screens on my tapering off two hours before bedtime and one hour before bedtime on my really maybe journaling, trying to get rid of any micro traumas I've experienced throughout the day. Just have a think about that. And uh, just to say on the supplementations, the only supplements we do recommend would be 15 micrograms of vitamin D3 a day. That would be between Halloween and St. Patrick's Day. We would say every day for the over 65s and if you're of South Asian or African descent. And the same message would hold folic acid 400 micrograms every day. And um, so that would be important. If you're looking at other supplements, do have a chat with your healthcare provider. And remember, iron needs do drop in menopause. So just do remember that. So, and iron supplements can actually cause a little bit of constipation. So when I thought about who is the Mrs. Bennett in my life, I could only just think of my own mother. And I asked her, what is her lived experience of menopause? So this woman, my mother is 80 years old. She was widowed at 50 and ex survived two strokes. And I can tell you she's as sharp as a tack. And she told me her experience of menopause was it is a hotel room upgrade. And when I delved in deeper, what she actually meant was she realizes on her plate, she needs less food, but more of quality. So she's finding that when it even comes to getting a cup of coffee, she gets pretty irritated if the coffee's not good. Her palates become more discerning because she's realizing her gut microbes like the good coffee beans. She's also learning to come to the table breathe a bit more deeper and have more poise and pace. So she's sitting up a bit straighter, you know, looking like she belongs in a good, ho good hotel room upgrade. But more importantly, by eating slowly, she's actually got to understand when she's had enough on her plate and had enough to eat. And she's now, although she was always conditioned by her mother to clear the plate. She's now become to understood what is a limit on her plate and she now understands her gracious limits. So my wish to you all as you go forward is to really go easy with yourself because this is a journey, but I have to say eating for health is similarly a journey. It is a process. It is not something that you switch on and it's on the next day. It's not a once off event. And I would be inviting you to start small, start now. Your future self will thank you and so will your present self. And to keep this journey really alive for you, there are lots of supports. I would be saying go to healthy eating on hse.ie or safefood.net. And often there are, people will find that they're gaining weight and they're not changing anything in their diet or exercising less. And the reason for that is as our estrogen and progesterone dips, it starts to release more of that hormone called insulin. So that should be kept in storage. And just like cortisol, the stress hormone, it can there's a tendency for it to leak out a bit and that can promote a bit of weight gain around the middle. So just to say, there is a healthy weight for you program. If you visit safefood.net healthyweight for you forward slash 
home. So thank you all for listening and thank you for bearing with my journey because it looks like I, 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 I got lost in between, but I got back on thanks to Jill and Deirdre. So thank you all for listening and every green light ahead on your journey to healthy eating. Thanks so much, Ashlyn. And we have a little bit of time now for some questions and answers. So if you'd like to uh, use the chat button there to send some questions through to Ashlyn, if you have any, if you send them through privately, so you'll see Ashlyn's name will come up as the presenter and uh, send it through there to her. And uh, we'll see how do you have any questions there, Ashlyn, coming through to you? So thank you. Uh, Deirdre, I just, I'm finding it hard to hear from my direction, Deirdre, so I think the reception is wavering a bit, but a question has come through. So um, one question is, is there any way of preventing the nighttime munchies? I always seem to munch for the hour or two before bedtime, and maybe it's just a habit. So thank you for that question. And certainly what's personal is universal. We can all relate to that. I can relate to that. And my tip would be to make sure that you have protein every time you're eating your breakfast, your lunch and your evening meal. So, you know, when we go home in the evening, we're, you know, if we live alone, we're not making intimate dinners for four people when it's just eating, it's just us eating the dinner. So the more we can have protein every time we're eating, the better we will regulate our blood glucose, which regulates our appetite. So that that's um that's a very, very common feeling. So thank you for sending that question in. And there was just another question that came in about should we go gluten free? And it's only if you're diagnosed with celiac disease that we would recommend a gluten free diet. If you go to the HSC's forward slash healthy eating, it gives a lovely direction on carbohydrate portions after the age of 50. And once we stick to that, um, if you don't have celiac disease, you know, you should really enjoy your gluten. OK, there's another one in there, Ashton. Are the calcium levels in almond and oat milk sufficient for perimenopause? Can you hear us OK, Ashton? OK, we seem to have lost Ashton or Ashton is having trouble uh, hearing us. We'll try and get the answer uh, to that query if that person wants to email uh, separately, um, we, as I say, we'll try and get try and get the answer back from from Ashton at some stage on that one. So at this stage, um, just due to our technical difficulties and apologies for that, I just wish to sincerely thank Ashton Murphy for such an informative and an insightful webinar today. Um, I suppose lots of food or healthy food for thought, we'll put it that way. So thank you very much, Ashton.